Oh, you're talking to me. Well, hello to you too then, stranger. <laughs> Forgive me. I'm not used to people coming up to me. Especially not ones this attractive. You're not from around here, are you? Otherwise, I'm sure I would have noticed you before. And no offense, but you don't really fit in with the crowd. The folks here tend to have some unique qualities. Very much state of themselves. They can sense an outsider from miles away. So you best be careful. Ah, oh, so this is your hometown. I see. After fleeing the nest, you've come back for a brief visit. Somebody your age won't find much around these parts. Everyone ends up moving to the bigger cities once they're old enough, and only come back every now and again. Well, that's the fate of a small town. But I think the people here like it that way. Nothing changes, and the elders still get to set the rules. It stays quiet, homogenous, and nobody cares to speak up against the choices made. Most rural towns share a similar mindset in that regard. They prefer their secluded communities, keeping things as they are. Humans tend to be terrified of change, after all. <clears throat> they always have been. Funny, isn't it? How people like to think they've gotten so far, developed and incorporated so many new things into society. But still, deep down, it's the exact same being. Driven by the same motivators, sharing the same fears. People like to consider themselves complex. I suppose they are in some ways. But how deep do you have to dig to find the same core within everyone? The same urges, needs, desires. Their yearning for love, for approval. Their hunger and thirst, their fear, their confidence. Still... They are so quick to judge, to ignore somebody in need, because they don't deem that person worthy of help. Because surely, if that person worked harder, if they'd been better, they wouldn't be in such bad situations, wouldn't they? Oddly enough, some use that same metric for themselves, too. Maybe they want to believe life is fair, that people get what they deserve, that in the end, there will be some kind of reward or punishment for their behavior. Randomness is a terrifying thought, isn't it? The idea that nothing actually matters. It's much easier to believe that there's a reason. A good, a bad, a choice that makes a difference. <clears throat> People need that, in a way. Because it wouldn't be fair to see evil succeed, to see a good person struggle. What would be the point of being good in a world like that? What would be the point in trying? Humanity truly is fascinating. So simplistic, yet so complicated. In a way, they remind me of ants. Hustling and bustling about, each trying to contribute to the colony whilst attempting to keep themselves alive. And they fear to look further than the comfort of their own home. The warmth and familiarity. But sometimes, hmm. They get lost. They need one another, but hunger and the yearning for more drives them out into the wilderness where they can't care for themselves anymore. Where they end up being exposed to the elements, to predators, all alone with no sense of self. <clears throat> or perhaps, if they're lucky, they stumble into a new colony. I suppose everyone is searching for something. Ants and humans alike. But the question is... What? How about you, stranger? What is it you are looking to find? You too appear to be a bit lost within yourself. As though you don't know what you really want. Hmm. But it's clear you're craving something. Company, perhaps. Love. Greatness. A distraction. Punishment. When you think about it, how many others might feel exactly the same way you do? People always seem to think they're 
struggles are unique, as though nobody would ever be able to understand them. You wouldn't believe just how many have had their near identical experiences. The same feeling of lacking something. The same words of discouragement whispered in their head. The same nightmares keeping them awake. <clears throat> Humans are quite interesting creatures. Somehow they're all so similar, and yet they're all entirely different. Though perhaps they're not as unique as they'd like to think. After all, they carry near all of their ancestors within them, in one way or another. Not only in appearance, many behaviors are learned too. So perhaps, without even realizing it, they laugh the way their great-great-grandmother did. Or hold a pen the way a distant relative in the 19th century used to. Your preferences, your taste, the way you see the world, the way you walk, the way you dress, your favorite scent, your hair color, texture, and then every single cone and speck within your eyes. All of those things are not uniquely yours. And if you were introduced to every person in your bloodline, you'd be surprised just how many of your traits you would find mirrored in them. Still, there's probably nobody who is exactly like you. Is that what makes you different? Or does it make you less unique? Since you are just a composition of everyone who ever came before you. If you think about it, your entire being is a story. A love letter to people long gone. Or perhaps a biography of pain and mistreatment. You might never know. All those memories are lost, after all. And there's no way of retrieving them. We do not have the ability to go back in time and see for ourselves, to ask those who've passed. That kind of power is not for us. And even if it was, people might only abuse it. On a similar note, though, I wonder, if you were a god, what would you do with that influence? Would you destroy what is left of humanity? Would you try and guide them towards a better world? Or would you simply watch, study them, see what they come up with on their own, and just how much of their success and failures they attribute to you anyway? Would you play favorites, rile them up against one another, have them fight for your entertainment, or would you end world hunger, bring peace upon humanity? Hmm? <laughs> A silly hypothetical. But you'd be surprised how many different answers I've gotten. Perhaps it says something about how you grew up. Or about your own desires. Maybe it's a reflection of what you believe you deserve. Or how you see those around you. Your empathy. Your deepest fears. Your strongest emotions. Especially since you aren't partaking. Merely an observer. Able to influence outcomes and probabilities. Give blessings and curses to those you deem worthy and unworthy. A strange thought, isn't it? An uncomfortable thing to consider. It raises the question of how much control a god would have, how much free will a person is really given. People like to think their thoughts and choices are their own, that they have control over what they do. But I suppose we may never know for sure. I'm beginning to like you, stranger. You have an honest stance that most others lack. You believe in the good of people. And maybe that's why you came to me. Because you think you can fix whatever it is you deem broken. Hmm. Or perhaps my mystery caught your attention. I don't think I'm fixable anymore. Though I have to admit the company is nice. I tend to spend most nights alone. I have... For a very long time. Always a stranger, hopping from one town to the next, never quite fitting anywhere. But I've never dared to move to a bigger city. They tend to be too much for me. Too many irritating lights and colors and smells and noises. All of that. <laughs> and I'd miss being able to see the night sky. The stars still give me a sense of comfort. A feeling of belonging 
that I've never felt anywhere else. <clears throat> I'm not quite sure why I'm telling you all this, to be honest. I guess that's just what happens when you approach a lonely drunk. They talk. A tradition that has been upheld for centuries. Mm. But in the end, it doesn't matter what I tell you. You too will forget about me. Eventually. Whether that be tomorrow or in a year. That will mean nothing in the trajectory of your life. And the next time you visit here, I'll probably be gone already. Because someone like me can only ever stay for so long without being noticed. And an outsider will only be tolerated for a certain amount of time. Hmm. I suppose, in a way, I'm running from myself. Still seeking the comfort of people, attempting to escape the loneliness. Even though I've never quite managed to find that. <clears throat> You've been the first person to talk to me in many years. And I'd like to thank you for that. I don't understand why you do it, but not many souls have your purity and curiosity. In a way, you remind me of somebody. Your presence just feels vaguely familiar. Like the melody of a song I'd almost forgotten. <laughs> Forget I said anything. Some things are best left in the past. Don't you agree? You know, we're not so different, you and I. I guess I've become just another person. A simple being yearning for approval. For the company of another soul. Even if they don't understand. It's difficult. But I imagine you know the feeling as well as I. In the end, even a fallen god is nothing but another human. For the most part. Enough of that, though. I'd rather not take up any more of your time. You have so little. Make it count, stranger. You might just be able to do something with it. You again. I met you at the pub the other night, didn't I? <laughs> I told you a face like yours stands out from the masses. Did you come here to watch the meteor shower? I see. I can leave, if you'd prefer being alone up here. Mm. Are you sure? <laughs> You're quite daring, stranger. How very unusual. But if you don't mind, I will gladly keep you company. Mm. Normally this place is fairly quiet. A few teenage couples every now and again, but they don't tend to stay long. It's a shame, really. Such a stunning view of the night sky is rare these days. Light pollution swallowed most of that beauty a while ago. Still, the stars are mesmerizing from up here, aren't they? Back in the day, people believed they were the souls of the deceased, watching over their relatives at night, and that the moon was the one guiding them all. A shooting star would be a soul passing from life to death, or the other way around. The belief has held up for a long time, and can still be found in some modern religions, Fascinating, isn't it? It reminds me of a story. Would you be willing to hear it? It's still a little while before the meteor shower reaches its height, so we might as well pass the time a bit. It's an old legend stemming from an ancient belief. A story of two gods in a curious young world. It goes like this. <clears throat> Once upon a time, very, very long ago, before things had names and when people were nothing but a vague whisper of the future, there were two siblings. One heart and one soul. Twins, you would call them, had they been born to a mother of flesh. The universe had birthed them, raised them alongside what would eventually become the first humans. And so, they watched the Earth one during the day, the other at night. 
They were the sun and the moon, the brightest lights that fell upon the only populated planet at the time, the only planet that mattered to them. It was said that the sky was their home. A broad universe could have been explored, but they chose to stay. They deemed that the people in the world needed their light. Long ago, they had frolicked through the galaxies, chasing one another, but they had grown since then and matured, starting to take their tasks more seriously. And once the first forefather of humankind stood upright, their rhythm had steadied. Days and nights became reliable, and slowly, the brothers grew apart, only getting to see one another at rare occasions, solar eclipses, and whenever the moon would grow lonely and visit the sky during the day. I'm sure you've seen it before. But they were always close at heart. They loved one another, cared deeply about their bond, about their people. One heart, one soul intertwined, pulsing in unison. Humanity grew to worship these gods, the safety they offered, the blessings they brought. They were grateful, lived and died in harmony, to be reborn once their time had come to live again. The god of the moon shepherded the souls of the dead within the night sky. They were the stars, shining brightly until he sent them back down to earth. In their time, the sky was littered with beautiful specks of light, a sight no modern human could even begin to imagine. It's a bit funny if you think about it. Nowadays, many people associate darkness with evil. Most gods of winter and snow are considered cruel, and the only offerings they receive are a bargain for peace. Back then, the god of the moon was respected and loved. The people understood that every night was necessary to rest, that during the winter, plants could regain their energy to feed humans once more. He was the deity of replenishing, reviving, resting, of the moon, the cold, and the night. And the people prayed to him, not to be kind to them or to hold himself back and keep them alive. No, they prayed to rest well, prayed for him to protect all the plants, cover them under his blanket of snow so that they could grow back even stronger. Prayed for the animals to be slow and the food to be plenty. He was the god of death as well as revival. They prayed for him to guide the deceased to safety so that they may rest and come back wiser, better, stronger than before. Every death, every grave, every nightfall was a celebration in his name. Offerings were burned, gifts were exchanged, a last honor bestowed upon the dead. His brother, on the other hand, was prayed to at every birth, every sunrise, before every hunt and every meal. He was the god of lights, growth, and fire. He was the warm summers that brought ripe fruit, the bright days of hunting and dancing. He was the middle, life, and physical growth, the day, the warmth, the energy. The god of the moon was everything around that, the spiritual and unseen side of things, yet no less worshipped. He was the life beyond, all that came before and after. They were complementary, and everyone knew that. One guarded during the day, the other at night. One guided them in life, the other in death. Wisdom, growth, development, and return. A steady cycle. And so it went for a few hundred years. The first gods, the only ones for a little while. Though, eventually the god of the moon began to grow lonelier. Guarding during the night time, when most were asleep, watching them all alone. I do believe they had been growing apart then already, considering they would only meet so rarely. Yet still, they were brothers. Despite everything, they were a team, connected by the blood of the universe within their holy veins, the only beings that could understand one another's troubles. But it went as it had to. As most other religions have, they too came to an end, eventually. 
a new group of people had moved onto their native lands, and they brought different, newer gods with them, much more radical. They captured the siblings' followers and gave them a single choice, convert or die. For they believed in gods of war, blood, gods of brutality. And so the brothers had to watch as their loyal people were slaughtered one by one. Watch the last bit of faith fall from their own over the years. They were unable to interfere, unable to save their people. The gods tried to fight it, but even they could only do so much. Both of them were filled with horror. They didn't know what would happen next. The brother of the moon refused to leave their last believers behind. But I think the brother of the sun was... scared, worried they would disappear. And so he left while the moon stayed behind, watching over the last few that had faith. The brother of the sun then decided to build himself a new life, a new identity. And as the last few sparks of hope died, the god of the moon fell to the earth, found himself in a human body. Though that alone wouldn't have been an issue for him, he could have lived and died upon the people he once loved, despite their lack of belief in him. But as time passed, the god did not age. He could not die. The god of the moon was damned to walk these crumbling paths until they fell apart, and then again, some more. Watch societies rise and fall around him, experience every pain of the world without ever feeling relief. And for what? To learn? To repent? To suffer? He could not understand what he had done to their mother universe to deserve such torment. Walking throughout the world for thousands of years alone. About 70,000, to be precise. But as time went on, he could not help but grow distant. After a couple millennia, he went to visit the churches of his brother's new followers. He tried praying to their god, but did not get an answer. No, most of them never did, to be fair. He even read some of the scriptures, but... Hmm. Never mind. For the rest of eternity, the god of the moon was cursed to wander the earth, watching what had come of his once beloved humans. Of course, they did not recognize him, he was but another stranger to them, and despite so desperately wanting to, he never felt the presence of his brother again. So, he was left stranded in the mortal realm, unable to die, unable to help, unwilling to pick a new face. Stuck for eternity, left to wonder why his brother would just abandon him, all alone for the first time in his existence. That's how it often is, isn't it? Believing that you know a person, that you can trust them until something happens and they change. I don't believe the god of the sun meant any harm to his brother, but still I fail to understand why he never came back. Maybe he found a way to die. Though, ultimately, death isn't really an option for a fallen god, even if they walk the earth in a human form. That's because a form is all it is. They're not human, and they never will be. It's a lonely endeavor, but that's what one gets for being forgotten. His brother, on the other hand, might still have power. Maybe he resides in whatever castle his followers dreamed of, feeling no need to visit the earth. Perhaps he abandoned humanity, as he did with his brother. Or he rules above the sky, like the grand overlord he dreamed to be. <sighs> they had once loved one another so deeply. Envy or wrath were foreign to them. They ruled their people kind and fair, side by side, that was until the day the brother of the sun felt abandoned and became somebody else. He chose a new name and decided to regain the favor of humans after he'd been disregarded. The god of the moon never dared to follow in those footsteps. He'd given up on the idea. He did not want to become something new. He only yearned to be himself by his brother's side once more, helping people 
answering prayers, receiving offerings, and granting blessings. But that was impossible. Even if people began believing in them again, things had changed. What had been done could not be undone. I'm sorry. The story always gets me rambling a bit, but so far nobody's ever bothered to listen. Thank you, stranger. There definitely is something special about you. Never lose that spark. Hold on to it, and don't let anyone take it from you. Look, meteors. It's starting. <laughs>